Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal. I'm your host, Greg Anthony, and you're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can catch my show every day, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. FirstAmendmentRadio.com. You can also go to LibertyRadioLive.com, and they play reruns of this show, as well as three or four uh, FM or AM stations across the South and shortwave. Now, uh, there's several questions I want to deal with in, uh, today and tomorrow, and they are this. Uh, have you ever wondered uh, the Vatican agenda with Jerusalem? Have you ever wondered if the Vatican created Islam? And uh, have you ever wondered how much money the Vatican really has? I'm going to deal with those questions, uh, that particular in that order. It'll probably take me a couple days. But all we have is time, right? All we have is time. But anyway, let me tell you this. Uh, let's start out by uh, talking about the media and how this is covered on the media. Because many people, I can go, oh, sit down at a coffee shop somewhere and mention those three subjects. And most people will roll their eyes and uh, basically say, oh, he must hate Catholics. Okay, well, first of all, I understand how people roll their eyes, but I I do not hate Catholics because I was born a Catholic. That would mean I would have to hate myself, which I don't. And, in fact, the only reason that I'm talking about this is because I felt I had an obligation to understand about the hierarchy of the religion. And, uh, well, I found out it wasn't just a religion uh, that I was born into. And I think that is uh, pretty normal, don't you? Uh, and especially when I chose journalism, uh, when I was in college, I decided to be a journalist. And uh, let me tell you something. The reason I did that was because I had this uh, idea that I wanted to find out the truth about things. I wanted to write about things on a daily basis, story after story, uh, in a sense to uh, learn about things and to tell people what was happening uh, in their city, in their state, in their country, in their world. And so my uh, quest began working on a small uh, newspaper as a college uh, a writer. And then I uh, became an editor of my college newspaper for a year, went off and got a job uh, after struggling a year out of college, couldn't find a job. Uh, my first year out of college, so I spent a year in law school. And uh, then when I finally got my first job on the Naples Daily News in Florida, I got into my little Dodson I remember I had at the time and drove all the way to Florida and began uh, writing newspaper articles. Very naive young reporter, but, you know, I had a... uh, had a sense uh, or a quest to keep going at it, to keep writing at it. So I ended up, uh, years later, ended up in in Rome, Italy. And basically, uh, that changed my life. And I happened to be there during the Vatican Bank scandal. And I learned a lot about the uh, supposed religion I grew up in and found out a lot of interesting things. Now, one thing I did learn there was that the Vatican is a corrupt organization. They have a money laundering bank that they use to uh, do many, many things. I found out they were involved in genocide. They were involved in many, many things that basically surprised the hell out of me. So uh, I put that in my, you know, memory bank and continued on and uh, learned a lot more as the years went on. Now, the point, when I was in Rome, one thing I did learn was that the CIA owned and, and, and funded the American newspaper there. So I started to get an idea that the profession I chose was corrupt as well. And it kind of, uh, I was kind of disillusioned. Uh, but personally, I said, you know what? That's not going to change my goals of finding out what the truth really is. And if it happens to step on the toes of the Pope or happens to step on the toes of high-level officials, then so be it. That's what we were taught in journalism class. Search for the truth. And another thing we were taught is to go for that story that no one else has. You know, get the scoop. That's the way we grew up. But what happened to the press? Well, it's a sad story, 
that I chose that profession uh, from a standpoint of looking how corrupt it is and then looking at the media. Uh, you have to look at it from, I looked at it from the American standpoint because that's my home country. I mean, we can look at the media all around the world and find a lot of things, uh, uh, oh, that may not apply here. But let's just concentrate on the American press. So we have the CIA newspaper in America. Uh, it was the American newspaper there. I am sure they had their money in the French American newspaper and other newspapers around the uh, world. So we spend a lot of money on propaganda. Secondly, uh, what I found out is when you come back to the States, the stories that I learned there about the Vatican were never covered. And so I started to think about it. I started to think, what is really going on with the American press? And am I still a part of it? Well, when I came back, I kind of uh, decided uh, at, in the beginning to, uh, I, I don't think I want to uh, do this anymore. But I ended up owning a couple small little newspapers and uh, basically had to cover of local events. So while I was sitting in my newspaper, I would research these larger events that were going on in the world and kind of was a uh, little bit of a hellraiser in the very conservative American town that I was in. And uh, that was at the beginning before the Internet started. And when the Internet came in, uh, my newspaper kind of uh, the money wasn't there the advertising situation changed and so it was kind of a downhill uh, project but anyway it was a good experience now when I looked at the uh, coverage in America I found that it was slanted uh, and one of the reasons is right now I think there's only five or six corporations that control 90% of what you read here and, and uh, go to bed thinking is the truth. And one of the things I remembered was this. If you believe in something, if you have factual evidence, stand by your story. Now, if you listen to what's going on on Fox News, which is the right-wing organization in America, you will not hear anything about the Vatican, and you will hear constant uh, arguing with the left wing, let's just say CNN or NBC, some of these other stations. You will not hear anything about the Vatican there. But they argue back and forth about politics, about, uh, oh, for example, uh, since I've been born, okay, I was born during the Korean War, and then we had uh, the Vietnam War, and then we had the Cold well, we no, wait a second, the Korean War, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, oh, and a number of ones in between, and then, of course, Iraq, and uh, now we have the War on Terror. So, you know, I'm used to living with war, at least listening to it on the radio all the time, or on the news, or on reading about it, or hearing about it, and... Uh, on TV, but did it, am I getting the real story? As a journalist, I said no. Something else is going on. Uh, and so, guess what happens? The Internet springs up, and all of a sudden, you're getting what is supposedly the other side of the story. But then again, I go back to my experiences in the Vatican, uh, working in Rome, and I said, boy, even these supposed truth-tellers on the Internet are kind of not covering this. They, they forget about the Vatican. They never hear anything about it. Oh, and so, uh, being a journalist, uh, what happened after, let's, let's use my personal story here, what happened after I decided to get out of my little newspapers, I decided you know, to go back to law school. I said, you know, I'd better start thinking of a way to support myself when I get older because I have a feeling these stories that I'm working on aren't going to uh, pay for, uh, you know, the bills here. So I decided to pick up that one year that I went to law school when I couldn't find a job as a journalist, and I finished my law degree. And during that period of time, I studied hard. I got my degree, uh, and... Worked in several law firms to make uh, some money. And I worked in workers' compensation law, worked in a firm that did some criminal law. And uh, 
basically what happened when I graduated, it was right around the time of 9-11. And outside of that being my birthday, that day was ruined for me. Because uh, I like celebrating birthdays. I don't care what people say. As you get older, you forget about them. I like them. Because, you know what? It's a great day to say, hey, I made it through another year in this crazy world. So anyway, uh, I decided, you know, I started to think about it. And all these stories started to come out. And I said, I bet you the Vatican has something to do with this. So I began to write articles, and not about the Vatican, because I couldn't find anything. I mean, they're very oh, an organization that's well hidden behind Jesus, God, uh, all their traditions. The, oh, you know, they seem to forget about all the Christians they killed. And uh, as we see today in the news, uh, 90, well, 20 Christians were just beheaded by uh, the war, you know, on ISIS now and this war on terror. This reminds me of what was going on during the Crusades. But, uh, you know, remember this. After that, uh, the Vatican, it made, made no, first of all, they were fighting the Muslims, but they were also fighting Christians. And uh, they seem to be the ones always in the middle of these fights, don't they? But they always end up on top. I, I have always wondered about that. And when you live in Rome, you see all this gold, all this pomp and glory. And, oh, my God, you should listen to some Italians sometimes talk about it. They know the truth. And they kind of sarcastically, uh, I remember when I went there, uh, Pope John Paul II uh, was, he, he was in power. I don't call him, you know, he calls himself God on earth. I call him like the uh, Pontifus Maximus. Well, he was in power. I mean, he's Polish, first Polish pope, I guess, in the history of the world. Uh, and uh, when I was there, I was sitting having, you know, a little some cheese and a little glass of wine with some of the locals. And uh, their Italians are fun to be with, you know. Life is an adventure every day. Let's forget about the world events. Uh, there was nothing we can do about it anyway. And be happy that you get a pair of shoes on your feet and food to eat and a good glass of wine and cheese. And, uh, you know, sometimes their outlook on life uh, is much better than what I see here in this country. Oh, yes. But anyway, uh, that's me. Uh, so they'd say, hey, what are you doing here? You're Polish. And I'd say, yeah, yeah. And they'd say, oh, I know why you're here. You're here to collect money because you're one of the illegitimate sons of the Pope, and you're here to get your money. And I'd laugh, and I'd say, oh, <laughs> you know, they know something I don't know. Uh, but anyway, as I went back into uh, the legal profession, uh, I decided when 9-11 hit, I decided to start writing again. And so I put off taking the bar exam. Oh, let me tell you this. Uh, to set the record straight, I did take it, oh, about four years after I graduated from law, four or five years. And I said, you know, i got to do this. But I couldn't get my head into it after that. I did not study at all. I was constantly doing these radio shows and thinking about 9-11, doing research on it, doing research on the Vatican, and I could not get my mind around these 13 subjects in law that you need to pass to uh, get your license. And maybe that's a blessing in disguise, but I don't know. So I took the bar knowing, I mean, I sat in there for three days and I just knew that <coughs> somebody has to get the lowest score uh, you know, there's so many, how many kids take it every year, or, or men, adults, women, whatever, take it every year in California. I said, somebody has to have the lowest one. So I said, uh, you know, why not me? So anyway, that's how I felt when I left that exam. And uh, sure enough, I don't know if it was low, but it was pretty low because, uh, you know, you have to really dedicate yourself to the, to pass that thing. And they have all these classes and things you got to pay for, and it's amazing what you got to go through. Uh, to get your criminal license to steal, I guess, but and get into their little uh, uh, into their little uh, club. But uh, anyway, that's either in here nor there. So uh, I go back and start writing and working in the internet, and I find that the same thing's going on there. Oh yeah, they tell you a little bit more about the new world order, or, and they seem to be more progressive, and people's uh, their quest, you know, to find out more because they know they're not getting anything on the, the mainstream news outside of, you know, uh, 
this orchestrated uh, uh, attempt to lead us into another war, and they never get into who's really funding it, who started this, who created all these organ, you know, created all these terrorist groups, who created, uh, you know, they never get into the fact that uh, Pope Pius XII was a good friend of Hitler. You know, we do stories on that and how the Jesuits uh, created Stalin. Actually, he should be called uh, Jesuit Father Stalin. So we don't get a lot of this stuff. And... Uh, so people naturally migrate to the Internet. But let me tell you this. I learned one thing. On the Internet, they do the same thing, but they give you a little more, but they're not going to really get into the Vatican story. Now, you're going to then search for people that do, and there's a couple little stations that will cover these stories. And, uh, you know, so you can get a little bit of information, but only the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg about, what the Vatican's really all about. And uh, I migrated to that subject because of one thing I learned as a journalist. Cover the things that aren't being covered because sometimes the truth lies there. And uh, sure enough, uh, I learned, have learned a lot over the years and still am at it, uh, telling people a lot of different things about this organization and uh, it's amazing how much you really find. And the more you learn, the more you go, what am I going to do with all this information? However, throughout this uh, quest to find the truth about this group, and I say this only uh, from a point of view of you, the listener, the reader, take it, uh, what, what they do in the mainstream news uh, press is they play the Hegelian dialectic quite well. And uh, they leave out important stories, I think, the, the real truth behind what's really happening in our country, who really controls it, what's the Federal Reserve Bank all about, taxes, the whole works, including the Vatican. They don't give you the, the real behind-the-scenes stuff. Now, when you start delving into that, they call you an anti-American, anti-God, anti-Catholic, you know, everything, every name under the sun, which is a first sign that you're on the right track. Now... Their Hegelian dialectic does not cover the side of the story. So what I'm saying to you is, is, you know, all well and good. There's no sense fighting these people. And I see a lot of people uh, get into trouble because of, uh, you know, they become uh, revolutionaries. Uh, they become, uh, oh, then they, there's this group that just runs away into the woods and wants to, to live way off the grid of America and pretend they don't live here. And that's not good either. The real way to deal with this is to understand who they are, to tell them who they are, and to just demand that they uh, give us the other side of the story. For example, let's, let's deal with it. Before we get into these three questions, I may have to even do another day. What's the Vatican's intent on Jerusalem and America's intent on Israel? Uh, what's the Vatican? Did the Vatican create Islam? And the reason I wanted to touch on that is because we're in the midst of this, if you listen to the news, this big war on terror. We got Muslims, uh, we got Islam, uh, terror, you know, extremists, uh, cutting heads off of Christians. They just kidnapped 90 Christians in Syria. And uh, that's on the news. So we have this, uh, our leaders are saying we're in a holy war, so we might as well get to the bottom of what this holy war is all about. And the question becomes, did Vatican, did the Vatican create Islam? And who is Mohammed? So we'll get into that. And I know you're always wondering, how much money do these, does this, uh, does the Vatican really have? And if you listen to the mainstream media, they don't even, they think they're a, you know, they might as well be, uh, all they consider them is the moral compass of the world. Okay, I know that's got to be wrong because I don't want to follow their moral compass. When you, If you sit there for two days during the Vatican Bank scandal, if that's the moral compass we're to follow, you know, I might as well be Al Capone and they'd like me more than being an honest person. Okay, so what I'm getting at here is... When we listen to, oh, I better check the time because, oh, yeah, we got about five minutes. Uh, what I'm getting at here is if I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, well, first of all, what's the Hegelian dialectic? And what it is is 
a way of creating a thesis, an antithesis, to get the synthesis you want. And that little uh, little uh, formula is used in most everything that goes on in this New World Order. I call it the Jesuit Vatican-led New World Order. And I add those two names at the front because I think that there needs to be a lot of uh, research done, uh, honest research, into what these people are all about. Now, uh, so we have uh, this Hegelian dialectic going on, and we're just talking about it in the media right now. So we have a group on the left, which uh, I will start out with Bill Riley because he's got the largest uh, cable show. Uh, and he's a very, very conservative. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's got this show that uh, everybody likes, to, and he's constantly berating the right, constantly, you know, and he'll bring on people that will represent the right, and, you know, their argument goes on. But they don't get into, oh, and he's a, he's a Catholic. Oh, yes, uh, he will not say anything contrary to uh, what they, you know, that you learn in catechism class when you're a kid. So I say that, you know, I have a lot of similarities with Bill O'Reilly. First of all, I'm a Catholic. He is. He's Irish. I'm Polish. We all, you know, when I grew up in Chicago, I grew up with most of my friends were Irish. Um, and Polish and, and Italian. So we have a lot in common. Then we both... Uh, became a journalist. He uh, migrated quickly into uh, TV back then. And, then, you know, to me, that was kind of fluffy. When uh, He's a little older than me, but not that much. And he went into that fluff thing where you talk on the news, and they didn't get, you know, back then when there was no Internet, uh, print journalists kind of looked down and said, you know, these guys on TV, they're just talking heads. So he went that way. And... Uh, uh, he continued up the ladder, or CBS, ABC, all that. Now he's got his own little cable show on Fox. And, uh, you know, he writes these books, Finding Jesus, uh, find, you know, Killing Jesus, Killing Patton. I mean, and when I look at a lot of that, I, I say, you know, here's a guy that's made a career on uh, hiding a lot of things from you. But everybody loves him, and he makes a lot of money, and he he seems to be always fighting the left-wing journalists, and they don't talk about what I talk about either. But one thing he did say yesterday was this: he said, if you believe in your, if you're being a, if there's a smear campaign against you, and and constantly the left and the right are smearing each other, uh, media people. Uh, on TV, you know, you've heard about Brian Williams on the on the left. He's now been he says he embellishes stories, and then they came back and said Bill O'Reilly embellishes stories, and uh, he said this. He says, "Listen, I did not do that, and if you if you if there's a smear campaign against you, stand your ground." And I said, "You know what? That sounds familiar because uh, when I started really on the internet." Knowing that maybe I'd get a little bit more truth there, and when I started really talking about the Vatican, there was a smear campaign against me. Oh, yeah. They called me every name under the book, crazy, lunatic, uh, what else? Uh, oh, that I was actually working for the Jews, and I had a, uh, I was controlled by the American CIA military, all these lies. And so I stood my ground, just like he said. And I said, you know what? Um, Secondly, I know I'm on the right track if they're doing this. So I've stood my ground, and uh, Bill stands his ground. Brian Williams will stand his ground. And the point I'm trying to make is they will not legitimize the ground that I stand on because it will affect their pocketbook. And I'll be back in three minutes on the investigative journey. Visit crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the left behind movie 
with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, we're back on the Investigative Journal, and as I was saying in the first half hour, uh, <clears throat> when you look at the mainstream news, you see this Hegelian dialectic uh, formula uh, right out there in the open for you, if you know what it is to begin with. I recommend you look it up, uh, because it's used in many, many different areas. It's used in uh, war, it's used in religion, it's used in most everything. Almost every uh, scenario, if you look at the abortion issue, they do the same thing. Uh, if you look at race, they do the same thing. And if you look at the media, they do the same thing. So we have these talking heads making millions of dollars, uh, go fighting back and forth uh, regarding uh, whether they tell the story right or whether they're left wing, but they never get into the story that uh, we tell on this show. And um, they even label like people like, uh, you know, they stay away from anybody on the Internet that's a controlled media um, plant like Alex Jones and a few of those other people uh, because that's a whole different world. And they like to categorize that world as crazy. And then if you go to the point where I go, which has been, they call that the alternative media, but where you go, where I go is to the alternative of the alternative media. And boy, they do not. And I think if you get to the alternative, to the alternative, to the alternative, to the alternative, that's where you're going to find the truth. But these guys make their money that way. And uh, there's no sense fighting it. In fact, um, I kind of enjoy what they do because uh, it really does show you what the world's all about. And so I applaud them. I say, okay, Bill, tell us your story. But you know what? Do me one little favor. Don't think you're getting it over on anybody or at least on me and at least on a few other people that I know. Don't think we don't catch what you're doing. But you're not going to force me into saying crazy things. You're not going to force me into uh, moving from my position just because I'm being bullied. Uh, you're not going to force anything because I'm going to take your advice. But I'm going to stand my ground, just like you do. And the point I'm trying to make is we're not really that much different. Uh, I started out as a journalist, so did you. And I bet you don't even have a law degree, do you? And I have one of those. So let me tell you this. In your world, that counts for something, doesn't it? You're constantly putting people on your new show that has credibility, so to speak. Well, where's mine? I have a couple big high degrees. You can call me Dr. Greg. Uh, but, you know, I think the reason you don't put me on is because of what I talk about. And is that freedom of speech in America? That's all I wanted to mention. And, you know, I think you should go on doing what you do. You do it quite well. And, uh, but at least tell the people. Why, you know, when you go home at night and put your head on the pillow, I think you know what I'm talking about. And uh, maybe someday, someday, you'll um, get down to telling the people who you really are. You know, and just, just tell it the way I'm telling it. You know, we don't give you everything, but we can't because we're controlled by certain people, and that's as far as we can go. And if we do that, we'll be fired or killed. Now, the left wing, 
uh, they play their, you know, game just the same way. So I say the same thing to CNN and Anderson Cooper, uh, Wolf Blitzer, uh, Don Lemon, all these guys. They say, yeah, I, you know, I know you're fighting the left, the right wing, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and that's good. But the same thing goes for you. When you put your head pillow, you know, your head on the pillow, someday you're going to have to research the question what you know you just can't say that my stance or the stance of the you know there's a lot of truth in the alternative media that doesn't cover the vatican there's a lot of truth for example why don't you ever tell the truth about the federal reserve bank um or uh the constitutionality of certain things that we talk about in this show uh but no you don't and we you know and i i kind of like what you do on your side you know, you really play that game well. and uh, But someday, I just wish you'd tell it the way it is. and uh, But you won't, because the same thing will happen to you that will happen to Bill O'Reilly if he does. You'll lose your job or you get killed. Uh, because you've got a lot of viewers, and they got to control that. And uh, the six corporations that control 90% of what you get on the news are all tied into the factor that I'm going to speak about. And we're going to start uh, today with a story that uh, always interested me, and we don't hear much about it. But what really is the Vatican agenda concerning Israel and Jerusalem? Now, there's a show on this station, uh, Barry Chamish's show, and Barry is a journalist from, uh, that walked the walk and talked the talk in Israel. And he he was a guest on my show many times when I was taking guests. And uh, go to his show to learn a lot about uh, the papal court Jews and how the Knesset is really bought and paid for and doesn't represent the Jewish people, just like the Congress doesn't represent the American people here. And uh, I found an article by one of his um, colleagues. He used to work with a man by the name of Joel Bainerman. And uh, he had mentioned him many times when he was on my program. And I found an article that Joel wrote that kind of explains this, that you will not get uh, on Mr. Uh, O'Reilly's show because he plays the uh, Hegelian dialectic on the right, uh, and that's good. You know, I, I, I'd i say all, more power to you. Uh, and then you won't get it on CNN because they play the Hegelian dialectic on the left, and that's to get their synthesis that they want you to understand. Well, this is a little bit, out of the Hegelian dialectic, but I think gives you a better view of this one simple question, their agenda, and their agenda, uh, and how do they view the legitimacy of Israel's claims to Jerusalem? That's a question that we want to ask. And so here's what Mr. Bainerman said. He said, most Israelis, and I'm quoting him from his article, have probably never thought very much about what the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, thinks about the end days of theology. Jews themselves don't give much thought to what will happen when Gog and Magog takes place. Jews don't go in for anything the least bit next world, but instead are firmly planted in the here and now. And no, he says, K-N-O-W, and that's good. However, it doesn't matter what Jews think. What matters is what the Vatican believes and why it believes this. Judaism and modern Jewish thought pretty much just dismiss the basic tenets of Catholicism outright and doesn't even bother addressing the core questions of what is behind Catholic theological claims. Instead of uh, taking what they believe seriously, we tend to snicker amongst ourselves when we see these pictures of obscure rituals and ceremonies and think the whole religion is near pagan-like with the, quote, eating of the holy wafers and, quote, sprinkling of baptism water on people's heads. Uh, oh, and I may add, uh, Joel, here, that uh, just recently was Ash Wednesday, and if you turned on some of these uh, mainstream media programs that I was talking about, we have our... Uh, some of the guests were, you know, on there with their ashes on their forehead because it was Ash Wednesday. Black ashes right on their forehead. Uh, yeah, it looked kind of weird. Uh, but 
that, uh, but uh, what matters is what they believe and what they plan to do about making their beliefs become a reality. Now, I like what Joel said there because I've said that many times. The reason a lot of times I will tell you about the pagan rituals in the Vatican that I saw right up in front when I was living there is because this is what they believe. This is what a lot of your leaders believe. That's why you have a obelisk, an Egyptian obelisk, worshiping Isis and Osiris, right in Washington, uh, right in the Freedom Monument. The Washington Monument is a is a uh, is a uh, symbol of worship to Isis. And isn't it strange that they call this terror threat Isis? <laughs> Not a coincidence, folks. Now, the institution of the Vatican is not really understood by Israelis and Jews. And uh, I will add Joel, and I'm quoting Joel here, it's not understood by 99% of Americans either, whether you're Jewish or not. Now, the conventional wisdom you get from the spokespersons in Israel and the Israeli government ministries and the conventional Israeli media is, quote, both sides have great intentions to do good. And that's about it. And that's about what you get here in America, too, isn't it, Joel? Yes, good good point. Now, he continues, when it comes to Israel's bilateral affairs, nothing much gets investigated by the Israeli media. <laughs> Seems a bit similar here, Joel, too. Uh, they do the same thing here in America. Now, thus, a secret deal could be done between the Vatican and the State of Israel, and nobody in Israel would ever find out about it. Now, that's a great quote that he just said. That's a great thing that Joel just said, because I've said this a lot in America. There could be secret deals between the Vatican and the State of, uh, of and the United States, and nobody here would know about it. So what is the media in Israel and America really doing? They're not doing their job. I think they're covering for them. So back to uh, Mr. Bainerman. He states, in fact, that is exactly what has happened in Israel. This uh, essay that he's writing, he says, will provide the background to deal with that, as well as what the Vatican's intentions are regarding Israel and the old city of Jerusalem. It will reveal which Israeli politicians made certain commitments to the Vatican regarding the issue of sovereignty in the old city of Jerusalem. These negotiations and meetings were all carried out in secret. During this period in 1992 to 1995, the Oslo Accords was what got all the public's attention. Oslo was like, quote, throwing sand in the eyes of the public. The Vatican is where the real action was happening. Oslo seemed to be just the cover story, a red herring, if you will. And listen to what Mr. Bainerman said there, because that's exactly what they do here in different things. They'll put out something, the Vatican behind the scenes, folks. We've done stories on this show that show you their connection to the Revolutionary War and how America was formed. And that just doesn't get covered. Never did. Oh, in the old days, they did a little bit more. But well, I'll tell you today... You won't get it anywhere. Now, he asked the question, what does the Vatican really want? Well, it can't be that the Vatican is only interested, he says, this is Mr. Bannerman, in, quote, access to their holy sites in Jerusalem. They already have that as well as legal jurisdiction under Israeli law for their institutions and assets in Jerusalem. Quote, uh, that's Mr. Bannerman, and he continues by saying also, when these, quote, holy sites were under the jurisdiction of the Jordanians from 1948 through 1967, no pope demanded the, quote, internationalization of Jerusalem. It is something else which the Vatican wants. The Roman Catholic Church need to have certain versions of events to be played out for them to stand in front of mankind and proclaim our Messiah has returned. Uh, of course, to the Jews, this Messiah will be as false as the first one was supposed to be, according to Jews. Now, don't matter. This is the goal of the Vatican, and that is what all Israelis need to worry about. Now, the Vatican, quote, Roman Catholic's version of events is this. They know that this isn't the end of the story, that the Jewish God had in mind. But that doesn't mean they won't try and engineer their own ending to the story. So what if it is my dog is getting tangled in wires here. So what if it is, now we'll be like, uh, okay, we're back. So what if it is fraudulent? 
it doesn't matter. That is their game plan, and that is what matters, and that is what Israeli Jews need to be better informed about. And I say American people need to be better informed about, because we're going to be in the midst of this kind of holy war, and I believe the Vatican's involved in it, and was involved in it from the beginning, way back during the Inquisition, the Crusades, etc. It's no different today. This is a very powerful source. Okay, it's important for everyone to know that the Vatican, had, what it has up its sleeve, because it directly relates to our existence and our future destiny as an independent nation. And I mean that as not only, and I'm saying this, not only for Israel, but for America as well. It's a very powerful force that is scheming to get control of the old city of Jerusalem, so you better know why and how the Vatican intends to do this. Once you have all the facts and the chronological record, you will be better informed, uh, deal with this issue, and uh, a foreign control over Israel's political existence and destiny. Now, I can just insert America's political existence and destiny hands in the balance, too. Now, it seems to me that Mr. Bannerman, and I've read this story a couple times in the past, he brings up so many facts here. And I, I tell you, this is just another way to understand, folks, that you're not, that these guys that are playing the left-right game on these news channels that are making millions of dollars don't want this stuff out. This is, this is factual good stuff that should be on the news, but it's not because it's not in the best interest of the Vatican or our, our the, the, the small minority of people who control the New World Order that this stuff be known. Now, here's what Mr. Bainerman says. Uh, this so-called Messiah that will be proclaimed. Uh, well, well, let me let me let me go back. I missed the uh, part here. He says first you have to realize that for centuries uh, the Vatican has attempted to obtain control of Israel of Jerusalem, which started with the Crusades. For them to convince the world that the Messiah they put on the world stage is going to be accepted as genuine. They need to perform this play in the old city. The story of this production is that this Messiah will merge the three monotheistic religions, usher in peace and harmony in the world, and solve the Middle East crisis. It's kind of like uh, when you watch your first, uh, the cavalry comes to the rescue, and I'm adding that myself. The location for this uh, movie production, says Mr. Bainerman, will be none other than the old city of Jerusalem. Now, this so-called Messiah that will be proclaimed will be a false one, and it will insist that by having, a, quote, a world government. So we have this false Messiah, according to Mr. Bannerman, coming to uh, create a world government, uh, i.e., uh, the United Nations. The world peace and harmony will be ushered in. This, of course, according to Mr. Bannerman, and I'm quoting him, will be a lie and a fraud, but never mind. In our world, reality is important, isn't important public perceptions are. The end result is the stripping of Israel's sovereignty as an independent nation, giving way to the regional block of nations in the Middle East. And I believe the same thing will happen here, in, and I'm adding this, the same thing in America, we will lose our sovereignty here as well. Uh, Israel will be pressured to accede to these demands by all world bodies and superpowers on the claim that, quote, this is the only way to solve the Middle East conflict. Now, in order uh, to the Jews to go along, they will convince them that uh, the world bodies and the superpowers on the claim that, quote, this is the only way to solve the Middle East conflict. Now, quote, in order to the, uh, for the Jews to go along, they will convince them that this, with the Messiah having appeared for the Jews, it is time to start rebuilding the third temple, what they call Solomon's Temple. Now, this version of events is widely available through a simple search on the Internet, as there are many Christian groups and organizations, the majority of which who are very pro-Israel, who don't buy into these beliefs and thus are against them. I didn't come up with this theory, says Mr. Boehner, and I'm just bringing it to the attention of the Israeli public. And I'm glad he, she, you know, and as far as uh, he's concerned, I'm glad it's being brought that I can read this to the American public, because it has a lot to do with us. 
Make no mistake about it, I'm back quoting Mr. Bannerman, the old city of Jerusalem, as well as most of the eastern half of the city, is what the Vatican is after. Why? Because controlling the entire old city of Jerusalem, and not just church properties, and being able to build whatever they want on Mount Zion is critical for the program they have planned to put into play into our capital city. The deal that it has signed with Israel via Yassi Belin and Shimon Perez, quote, and he says, in secret and without approval of the Knesset, gives the church not only extraterritorial status to their properties, quote, which is what the bilateral agreement the Israeli government signed with the Vatican on December 30th, 1993, put into law, but of control over the entire city as, quote, custodians under UN presence, in this way, the Jews will give up control over the old city to the Vatican. Uh, to the Vatican, the Israeli people would have a problem with. To the UN, they would say, we had no choice. Now, uh, let me add a couple things here, folks. Uh, this story is vital to the plans of the New World Order and their agenda. Uh, because it's not only a secular agenda. America, in my estimation, our military is the Roman legion of the world. And, in fact, at this particular juncture, the Roman legion of the world is standing down to allow ISIS to gain power so that we can get a bigger conflict. And that's why Obama is there. And he plays his role now as the dove weak president who does nothing while the Muslim forces grow and grow and grow, and the threat here grows and grows and grows. And uh, that's for another day, that story. But the story that Mr. Bannerman is giving us here, and I've only touched the surface, we're going to get into the chronology of the attempt by the Vatican to displace Israel from the old city of Jerusalem. Now, this chronology of events for the Vatican's conquest of the old city uh, will be discussed tomorrow on my show, because I do not have time today. And then we'll continue on with these other questions, how perhaps the Vatican did create Islam back in the seventh, uh, 700s. And then we're going to talk about the Catholic churches. You've always wondered, how much money do they really have? And when you find out they're the richest organization in the world, uh, it's going to be a little bit contrary to what you hear on Bill O'Reilly or the CNN uh Anderson Cooper shows. Yeah, well, because, you see, uh, a actually, uh, you know, if you get right down to it, they're being paid by them or some of their agents. Uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. And, and, you know, I'm not criticizing it. That's the world we live in. But uh, getting back to uh, this story, uh, we only got a couple of minutes left. What happens in... This, remember this, and I've said this throughout my shows. It's important what they believe. Not important sometimes what you believe. Because we're living in the world that we're being controlled by these people. And I don't think anybody would deny that. Now, I'm not saying to take away your belief. I'm not saying to stop. I think you should like, you know, listen to Mr. O'Reilly. He says, if you believe in something, stand by it. And I know that there's a lot of people that listen to this show and a lot of people that listen to the alternative media that may be deprived of this information that have strong beliefs that are probably closer to constitutional reality if you take the Constitution at its face, closer to what would make this country a better country. Stand by your beliefs. But that does not mean revolt. It does not mean run away. And the reason I say that is that's what they want you to do. And when you do that, you fall right into their hands. And I've seen so many good people get plowed over by these guys that, that my advice is to always, like, for example, in this show, I, the last thing I do is preach revolt, preach running away and becoming a survivalist. What I do preach is understanding these people so that you can enter into a debate with them on solid ground. And I believe that that is quite important. And um, that's what this show is all about. Uh, and I believe that the stories, many of the things that I say on this show have just as much or more credibility, probably more credibility in a lot of areas than what they say on those shows. But in the world we live in, it's not allowed. Uh, so uh, 
tomorrow we'll go into, uh, we'll continue with Mr. Bainerman's article on the chronology of the attempt by the Vatican to displace Israel and their goal of taking over Jerusalem so that they can create this one world religion with this false messiah as well as create a new world order. Which means the lack of the loss of sovereignty to us, loss of sovereignty to Israel. And this is all a plan that they've had for a long, long time. And it's best you start understanding it from that point of view. And I've always said on this show, you've got to put the secular with the spiritual uh, and mesh them together. Because at the top, you're going to find that the Jesuits and the Vatican play a big role in everything that goes on in our world. We'll be back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. Thanks for listening. And have a good evening and good night.